Grab your Bible tonight and uh, go over to Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. And uh, of course, as always, my notes are there in the church app. You can always pull that up, look at it, or you can go look at it later. Romans chapter 12. Let's look at verse 1 through 2. Then we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians 5 and then Hebrews 12. So Romans chapter 12 verse 1 reads like this. This is Paul writing. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Now I want us to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. Paul also wrote this. It says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be presented blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then I want to look at one final passage here. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Uh, The writer writes this, Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I want to take a second to just pray right here. Father, we thank you so much for uh, uh, your word tonight. It is the bread of life. Lord, tonight we come to your table, we open up your word, and we just ask you, Holy Spirit, to just breathe upon this, the rhema word, the, make it alive to us. Lord, these scriptures, maybe we've heard them a thousand times, but tonight I pray For the sake of teaching and learning and understanding, may we see them with fresh eyes in the faith of a child. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight we're going to continue uh, this series on We Believe, which is a foundational series in the 16 fundamental truths of the Assemblies of God. Last week we were looking at, um, of course, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the, uh, the doctrine there and we took a journey through Acts and we looked at all of the different frameworks of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the sign of spirit baptism, and uh, those types of things. Tonight, I want to look at the doctrine of sanctification. Now you say, Pastor, what in the world is sanctification? Well, tonight, I'm just going to pretend for a moment that some of you did not grow up in church and you don't know what some of these words are, so I'm going to endeavor to make it simple for you so that you can understand it. But tonight we're going to look at this million dollar theological word that is sanctification, which is simply um, dealing with the subject of holiness. Everybody say holiness. Now, uh, some of you just had PTSD, but we're going to track through this for a moment and see what God has to say. But before we do, let's look at our fundamental truth. It's number nine. I want to read it to you as I've done it in weeks past okay so here we go it says sanctification is an act of separation from that which is evil and the dedication unto God the scripture teaches that a life of holiness which by no man shall see the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit we're able to obey the command be holy for I am holy Sanctification is realized in the believer by recognizing his identification with Christ in his death and resurrection and by the faith reckoning daily upon the fact of that union and by offering every faculty continually to the dominion of the Holy Spirit. And so tonight we're going to look at this subject of of sanctification. So uh, let me just start out and say this. I'm I'm going to pretend like... Uh, I don't know where you're from or what you come from, okay? Because in this room tonight, there are people that were raised in what we would call old-time Pentecost. That's what my grandparents were raised in. My, my grandma was a, a bun-wearing, uh, and uh, by the time service was over, they got to shouting, and you had to dodge uh, bobby pins because they were flying all over from the hooking and the bucking and the shouting. Okay, some of you were not raised that way. You might have been raised Baptist or Methodist or Church of Christ or some other different area. So I'm going to pretend tonight not to think that you know the context from which I'm presenting. And so I want to paint a picture tonight. Here's, here's what I will say. For those of us who were raised in a uh, old-time holiness, Pentecostal, fundamental Baptist even uh, organization, 
Uh, nothing wrong with that, by the way. But you'll know exactly what I'm about to say. Many of us, when we were growing up, okay, everything was a sin. I heard a few hearty amens. Almost, it wasn't communicated this way, and I, and I jest a lot because I would not trade my upbringing for anything. But many, many people were to the point that if you got any enjoyment out of it, it probably was wrong. Okay? So, my, my great-grandparents, they didn't believe in going to the soda fountain. They didn't believe in going to the roller skating rink. Uh, they didn't believe in uh, going to the school dance. They didn't believe in anything like that. In fact, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, if it didn't happen at church, you probably weren't going to it. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and everything else that happened, you were, you were there, okay? You were a drug child. You were drugged to church every time the doors were open. Not a problem, okay? Um, however, in some of that era, there, there was something that, that caught hold. And you've got to understand, I don't believe that any of these people in their, um, in their fervor to serve the Lord... I don't think that any of them started out with this intent, but what happened in the church was a, a uh, leaning towards what we would call legalism, legalism, obtaining to the law. And so um, what happened was in, in a lot of times in old time Pentecost, okay, there were people who were teaching customs and things in an attempt to be holy as if they were gospel. Okay, I, I know some of y'all don't hear what I'm saying, or you say you don't understand, so let me just give you an example. I've got a friend that was raised in the old-time church of God, okay? The men, okay, not the women, the men were not allowed to wear short sleeves at all, ever, and certainly not short pants, Okay, now I'm hitting home with somebody. Now, my, my friend uh, who was pastoring in Apopka, Florida at the Grace Street Church of God, Joe Myers, I heard him tell a story one time about uh, a man who uh, was an, uh, an older man than him, which he would have been up in his 70s. They live in South Florida. You know, there's swamps and alligators and all that stuff. Very humid. And uh, the, the man was mowing his yard in 100 degree temperature, in jean, in a jean long sleeve shirt, in the middle of July, almost about to die of a heat stroke. And so they asked him, they said, why, why are you mowing in this long shirt? You're about to die. He said, because I was raised that you don't want to cause anybody to lust. To which my friend replied, if they're lusting over your elbows, they got a devil. Come on, somebody. But the thing is, is that that was taught in certain sects of church as if it was doctrine. I mean, it was, it was like in the Bible, commandment. Everything was wrong. My great-grandmother, I heard her say this out of her own lips. No disrespect nor dishonor to her, but she was old school. She didn't even believe in going to the movie theater, period. I don't care if there was the passion of the Christ. I don't care if it was the Jesus revolution. You didn't go to the movie theater because if Jesus came while you were in there, He wasn't coming in there to get you. Now, hold on a second. There was such an emphasis on external holiness, which is good. That there was legalism, but, but I, I want to announce to you tonight, this is no surprise to anybody, that the pendulum has swung from this side all the way over here to now where nothing's a sin. And you've got people who say, well, I'm a Christian and I can do this and I'm a Christian and I can do that. And, 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 and externally, they look no different than the world. They look sound, smell, anything, any different than anybody else. And so 
we, we have to look and see people, we're, we're, we're terrible at picking extremes. Picking extremes. Okay, you've got this side over here that is super legalistic and nothing is a sin and you can't even smile and, 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 and anything like that. And then over here it's just lawlessness and lasciviousness. So, that presents the question, what's right? I want to give you a truth that is just about true in every scenario. Rivers are the deepest in the middle. Rivers are always deepest in the middle. And the Scripture gives us a balance on every side. Can I show you? Bible talks about judgment. Bible also talks about mercy. Bible talks about hell. Bible also talks about heaven. Bible talks about for, uh, love. The Bible also talks about discipline. Okay? And so there's a balance. And so it's, it's, it's oftentimes we cling to one side or cling to the other. But the truth is the deepest part actually lies in the middle. And so tonight I want to I wanna look at this because there are several different beliefs surrounding the doctrine of sanctification. And so uh, one view, and I'm going to define that word sanctification for you in just a minute, but one view is believed that it's called total sanctification. They believe that sanctification happens in a believer's life in a singular event, just like salvation, just like the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They believe that there's a moment in your life where you are totally sanctified, okay? You say, who believes that? Well, diff di even different Pentecostal groups believe that. They believe in what is called total sanctification. It's the striving for a holy life and a freedom from sin that must occur to obtain this level of total sanctification, okay? Now, the most extreme view of this teaches sinless perfection. That the believer is no longer able to willfully sin. Okay? I don't know about you, but I have found that not to be true. All right? I have found out I can sin whenever I want to. Now, it doesn't mean I don't feel bad about it. Amen. That's what the Holy Spirit convicts you. But um, we're still in the flesh. So the other view is merely a what we would call a positional view of sanctification. That means... Because of my relationship with Christ, okay, Christ has sanctified me, and because of my position with Christ, then I am sanctified. And while that is not untrue, that is totally true, while that is not untrue, the extremists in that position think that because a, a, a person is a Christian, because of their positional relationship with Christ, then no external amount of holiness is necessary because I'm saved. I'm sanctified. Christ has set me apart. And so, you know, those are the type of people that when they are falling back, regressing, going into a sinful lifestyle, they, they get upset and they go, well, I'm saved. I'm saved. The question is tonight, what exactly does the Bible teach? And so I want us to, to get into this and look, and this is why I love our stance in the Assemblies of God because we take a twofold, a twofold position on the doctrine of sanctification. We teach positional sanctification, which simply means that Christ has sanctified us, He has set us apart, but then we also hold to this view of progressive sanctification, which simply means that as we're growing in Christ, as we're growing in God, as we continue to develop the fruits of the Holy Spirit, we as believers, having received a new nature in Christ, have a desire to live a holy life. And so tonight I want to kind of break that down for you. If you're taking notes, here's the first question I want to answer. Number one, what is sanctification? Okay? In the simplest terms, sanctified, okay, sanctified, which is the root word of sanctification, here's what it means. It means to be set apart. To be sanctified means to be set apart, okay? So I want you to think 
like this. You have 10 cookies, okay? You have them on the kitchen counter. You take one cookie, you set it aside for a special purpose. That cookie is sanctified. You have set it apart, okay? It's, it's, it's also kind of the same word where we get the word holy from, which has the same meaning. I want to show it to you in Scripture. Look at Leviticus 27 and 30. Now, this is not... Uh, This is a Wednesday night crowd. This is certainly not a message on tithing, but this illustrates it very simply. Leviticus 27, verse 30. I want you to notice what it says here. It says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. That word holy there is the same word sanctified. Here's what it means. It is the Lord's. It is set apart to the Lord. So in other words, when uh, the Lord God commanded the people of God in the Old Testament to to tithe, which was to take care of the temple, to take care of the Levites, um, the Lord set apart that portion unto Himself. Okay, So it belongs to Him. The tithe is the Lord's. That's why I tell people you have really two choices when it comes to tithing. You You can return it or you can keep it. Okay? but it's, it belongs to God. He, he calls us to set that apart for Him, and He gives us a test every single week on if we're going to honor Him or not. But here's what I want you to see. He said it is set apart. Now, in our context, looking at the word sanctification, we are to be set apart. We're, we are taken away from the whole. And we are set apart, holy unto God. In that sense, us as believers, we're sanctified by God and we're sanctified unto God. Get this, we are in the world, but we've been called out of the world and we're supposed to be different than the world. We are in it, but we're not of it. We have been sanctified. Sanctified, okay? And so that's what sanctification means. It's very simplistic. We have been set apart. All throughout the Scripture, God's people are told to be holy. They're told to be separate. Come out from among them. Touch not the unclean thing. What fellowship does light have with darkness? What fellowship does the temple of God have with idols? Come out from among them. Touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you unto myself, says the Lord. In the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were getting ready to go to battle, the Lord said, I want you to sanctify yourself, set yourself apart as holy unto me, for tomorrow we will go forth and wrought this victory. The act of setting yourself apart for God is something that we see all throughout Scripture. And so we need to understand that in today's culture and context, The doctrine of sanctification is as needed now as it has ever been. So, the second thing. We looked at what is sanctification. Here's the second thing. I want to answer the question, number two. What is positional sanctification? What is positional sanctification? Positional sanctification speaks of what happens when a person receives salvation. Okay? Now, You need to know this. Before you come to Christ, when the Bible describes you as being lost, separated from God, the Bible says we are in darkness. Okay? We are in darkness. We're not born saved. Jesus said you must be born again. And so we're lost. We're eternally damned without Jesus Christ in our life. And so we come to Christ We accept Him as our Savior, as our Lord. We accept His forgiveness by realizing the sacrifice on the cross was for my sin, for my penalty. He bore it for us. He took our place. The Bible says what happens at that moment, the book of Colossians describes it so beautifully. It says we've been translated. The word translated is the same word delivered. We've been delivered out of the kingdom of darkness. And He puts us into the kingdom of light. That means we go from the devil's family into God's family. That's a shouting ground right there. You've been delivered. 
You've been translated. You, you've been set apart. Listen, Christ's blood redeems us, forgives us of our sin. It, it, it's really related to the word justified. Uh, justification means uh, that the, our position with Christ makes it as if we never sinned. The blood covers it, but we've also been sanctified. We've been set apart. It's holy. Jesus separates us from the kingdom of darkness, puts us into the kingdom of light. We totally believe this. Here's the thing. One cannot be totally sanctified apart from faith in Christ. As I mentioned a moment ago, the, the old school legalistic holiness movement that many of us came out of started out pure. I would never, ever, ever fall to criticize my grandparents. In fact, I'm thankful for some of those things. But, here, but here's the thing though. The mindset that that starts to develop in a person over time is that my closeness to God is dependent upon what I do. Are you hearing me? My closeness to God is based on my works. And that's not the case, folks. Let me tell you something. You can, you, can, you can be so externally holy. Your dress can be the, the, the right length. Your hair can be the right length. Come on, you cannot wear short sleeves or no makeup. Come on. And you can be mean as a junkyard dog. Doesn't make you saved. It doesn't make you saved. But it, it causes people to strive to an external thing. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this into perspective in a moment because you, you need to understand I'm not criticizing at all. I'm wanting to show you both sides of the equation here. Positional sanctification says that because I believe in Christ, He has set me apart. That being said, that's not a total picture. Nor does the Bible stop right there. Because this is where a lot of people stop. They say, well, Christ has set me apart. I'm saved. It don't matter what I do. Not the case. Because the Bible talks about this other aspect. We call this progressive sanctification. So number three, let's answer this question. What is progressive sanctification? I wrote it down like this. It says progressive sanctification is what some people would call growing in grace. This speaks to our ongoing maturity as we develop as a believer. Now, I don't know about you, but when I gave my life to Christ, positionally, I became a saint. I was sanctified. I was justified. I was set apart. My holiness was based on Christ's works, not my own. But in my flesh, in my mind, in my person, I, I did not achieve sainthood status instantly. In fact, I hate to shock some of you, but I still haven't obtained it yet. So, what does that mean? That means when we start a relationship with Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in the inside of us and and makes Jesus alive to us. And He gives us a, a new clean heart. And He gives us a renewed spirit. Then as we grow, as we walk, as we continue to live for Christ, um, what happens is, is that the, the, that old nature begins to be crucified. And then we shouldn't have the desire to do those things that we used to do. Now, I'm just going to be real transparent with you tonight. That's not anything new, but just hear me for a second. When I gave my life to Christ, I was raised in church. Raised in church and, and uh, thankful for that legacy and heritage that we had. Um, when I was a teenager, though, I, you know, I don't know. There's a bunch of combination of things, but I just went wild. I backslid. That's the only word to say it. That's the Bible word for it. And that's the word I'm going to use. I backslid. I went back into the world. I forsook my relationship with Christ. I got involved with things I shouldn't have got involved with and picked up habits that I shouldn't have picked up. And, uh, you know, when I was 16, 17, 18 years old, um, 
everybody in my family smoked cigarettes. It was not an uncommon thing. In fact, in my family, if you didn't smoke, you were an outcast. And I had teenagers and friends in school that were tempting me and, and, and peer pressure trying to get me to smoke pot and do this and do that. And, and, and I grew up in the age of McGruff the crime dog that came to school and said, don't do drugs, drugs are stupid, hugs not drugs, come on. I grew up with that. And so I was a scaredy cat for the most part. And so I gave in to the lesser, what I would call the lesser of evil, and developed a nicotine habit when I was, you know, 16 years old. I wasn't serving God. I was running from Him with everything. Uh, so that kept on. Then when I was 18 years old, I went to work in a factory right out of high school. It was a smoke-free campus. But uh, when you have a nicotine problem, you, you still want your nicotine fix. And so I went to two in tobacco. So now I had two problems. Uh, when I was at work, I had a two in the back of problem. When I was off work, I had a cigarette problem. And you know the story. I've shared it before. When I was 18 years old, uh, the Lord really uh, reamed me back in and pulled me back and, and really just began to say, what are you doing with your life? That moment, I was running from the call of God out of church. Um, and then I was like, okay, Lord, I hear you. And I, I gave my life back to Christ and you know, I'm being honest with you, there were some things in my life that I was doing that stopped instantly. I stopped using bad language. I know for some people that's a struggle. For me, that was something that stopped instantly. Uh, the desire to listen to bad music stopped instantly. You know, I didn't go into the ministry until I was 23. And you know, even though I came back to Christ at 18, those, those, that nicotine habit had a hold on me until I was about 22 and a half years old. I was going to church. I was loving Jesus. I was trying to get free from it. But hear me though, I never justified it. I always wanted to get free from it. I was fighting to get free from it. I was so embarrassed by it, I would hide it. I know everybody could smell it. Good Lord, you could smell it everywhere. But I was hiding it. And, and, but, but the Lord was working on me. And, 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 and there came a point to where God delivered me from that. What's that? What am I talking about tonight? Progressive sanctification. Growing in grace. Growing in Christ. I like the way one old preacher said it. He said, he said, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Right? I'm growing in my relationship with Christ. Every day we walk with Jesus, we ought to love more. We ought to have more patience. We ought to be more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We ought to be growing. Listen, it's not sinless perfection but the holy spirit comes inside of us and helps us to look more like jesus so listen while i i painted the picture uh, earlier that external holiness ended up with a, a hold on legalism that the other part is true if you've really been impacted by christ there's going to be some change going to be some change so here's the thing christ sets us apart at salvation but the Bible also teaches us to set ourselves apart. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and he told, he told them to sanctify themselves. He didn't say, may God sanctify you. He said, sanctify yourselves. What does that mean? That means as believers, because we are following Christ, there are some things that we ought not do anymore. Right? Now, we're not, we're not not doing them to be holy. We're not doing them because there's been a nature change on the inside of them. So, let me, let me give you some examples because there are those who would argue that being under grace allows them to do whatever they want to do. Now listen, I believe in grace. We are saved by grace through faith. Not of works. Not of works. Lest any man should boast. I believe in grace. It's God's divine enablement upon the soul. It's His unmerited favor. But the grace message being preached today is incomplete because I never hear them mention Titus chapter 2. Look what Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 says about grace. You ready? For the grace of God 
that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Why? Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. I want you to notice what what Titus said. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And what does grace do? It teaches us. There's a whole lot of people saying grace saved them. But I want to know, is grace teaching you anything? Grace teaches us to, listen, deny ungodliness. The problem is, is today the pendulum has swung so far from everything's a sin to nothing's a sin that we have a hard time defining what is ungodly. Can I tell you? The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And then he says in the works of the flesh are the following. Drunkenness, revelry, sorcery, witchcrafts, envy, murders. Lying, drunkenness, drunkenness, filthy speech. The grace of God is supposed to teach us to deny ungodliness. And worldly lusts, and then look at the rest of that verse, that we should live soberly. Verse 12, that we should live soberly. We should live righteously, and we should live godly. Okay, let me repeat that. We should live soberly. We should live righteously. We should live godly, not in heaven, in this present age. See, what I'm trying to tell you is that the doctrine of sanctification simply says that God sets us apart from sin, but He also expects us as believers to set ourselves apart. Listen, I know it's not popular, but as a Christian, there's some things I am not at liberty to to participate in. I'm not. Doesn't have anything to do with being self-righteous, doesn't have anything to do with looking down my nose at people, But listen, I'm telling you, as a Christian, there are some things that I do not have liberty to do. Now, I still have some time. My grandmother's generation, you know, she said, doesn't matter what's playing at the theater, it's a place, her eyes, a theater was as worse as a brothel. The house of ill repute, you know. Ain't nothing going on at the movie picture show. Jesus comes back, He ain't coming back in there for you. Okay? Now, I agree to this extent that what you watch when you're in there matters. What you watch on your television matters. Let me tell you, there are some people, they just don't seem to have any problem watching the most ungodly stuff and they're like, well, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm a Christian. There ain't nothing wrong with it. Do you, let me ask you a question. Do you think if you were to ask Jesus, Jesus, is it okay with you if I sit here and pay to be entertained and to eat popcorn and to drink a soda and watch these people fornicate on the screen? Do you think he's going to say, hey, I'm cool with that? Do you think that Jesus Christ, who hung on the cross with every weight of every sin on His shoulders, died so that mankind could escape the eternal penalty of damnation and separation from God, do you think Jesus Christ would be okay with you paying to be entertained by sin? You say that today, you split your church. Who you think you are. 
It's doctrine. It's doctrine. Listen, I'm, uh, we're in the world, but not of it. There's some things we, should, we, we, we shouldn't listen to. It's just a song. I like the beat. Well, yeah, but you know, talking about adultery and talking about, you know, cheating and washing your sorrows away with your beer and, you know, everything else. I mean, do you, is Jesus, He's right here all the time. He never leaves you, never forsakes you. Is He okay? See, I, I, I think we would solve a lot of personal holiness issues if we would ask ourselves that question. Jesus, would you be okay with me saying these words? Jesus, would you be okay with me listening to this? Listen, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say I I'm, I'm, I'm make the bullseye every single time. When the Holy Spirit convicts me of something, I do my very best to turn it off and to get away from it. And that's all I'm really asking you to do as Christians is when the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and He brings His truth. L- listen, you've you got to understand um, holy is Holy Spirit, but holy is just really not His first name. It's, the, it's His attribute. He's holy. Holy. Holy Spirit. So God wants to sanctify us. Set us apart. That doesn't mean as a Christian you gotta, you know, wear a burka potato sack over your head and, you know, just look like you got ran over by a truck, but I'm not saying that at all. But you know, women still ought to dress modest, not being ugly. You come to some church services or youth events across, across culture, across denomination, whatever, and it, clothes are so tight and things are so revealing. Uh, excuse the phrase, but you, all you see is breast, leg, and thighs. It's not church, it's Popeyes. Amen. Not supposed to see all that at church. Now, if you came in off the street a prostitute, that's one thing. But if you're saved, cover it up. We need some older church mothers who with tact and not judgment will pull some of the young ladies aside and say, honey, that's a little too tight. Hello? I thought the Scripture said the older were to entreat the younger as daughters and the daughters were to entreat the older as mothers. Come on now. Progressive sanctification. We're growing in our walk with God. So what's the conclusion? I could, I could go on on this all night, but you get the point. What's the point? What we believe about the doctrine of sanctification is this. When we get saved, Jesus, by our position with Him, takes us and He separates us from the kingdom of darkness. Then, because of Christ regenerating us and separating us and setting us apart from the world, He then expects for us to set ourselves apart. To set ourselves apart from the ways of the world. Now, in today's society, it's not popular. Now, I know what some people say. Well, yeah, Pastor, but Jesus drank, or Jesus, Jesus got accused of, of being a wine bibber and a glutton, and he, he got accused of this and that. He sat and he ate with the publicans. And yeah, he did, but he didn't sin with them. He didn't sin with them. He wasn't sleeping with the prostitute in the brothel. He wasn't getting drunk at the bar. He wasn't doing all that. He was around them in proximity to minister to them, but yet he didn't succumb. Listen, let me just, let me just tell you. People say, well, I'm just trying to be like Jesus. Okay, let me give you a litmus test. Everybody Jesus got around changed. What about you? What about you? Are the people you're trying to witness to by doing worldly things... Are they, are they becoming like Christ or are you backing up into the world? That's the litmus test. Sanctification is an important thing and it is a work of the Holy Spirit. And I've closed with this final thought. 
as long as we are breathing. Everybody take your hand, okay? Now we're going to do a breath check. <laughs> Blow, right? As long as you can do that, you're going to be growing with this. Okay? Let me be honest with you. Some days you might do better than others. Okay? Pastor's not saying you're never going to have days that are imperfect. You don't, you don't take a hammer and, 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 and slap your thumb and, and, and a word from a long time ago comes to the surface. Okay? I'm not saying that won't happen. I'm not saying you're unsaved if that happens. But what I am saying is that the Holy Spirit on the inside of us makes us want to change and be more like Jesus. And that's what we need to strive to do. Stand up with me tonight. Let me pray with you before you leave. Hallelujah. I don't know if you remember where you came from, but I sure do. And man, I'm so thankful that the Holy Spirit's not only worked on me, but He's still working on me and will continue to do so. The grace of God that we've been saved by will teach us to live godly, to live soberly, to live righteously. He didn't say positionally. He said to live that way. So let's pray and ask God to help us. Father, we